Welcome to the Lean Out Your Business podcast, a show dedicated to helping entrepreneurs accelerate business growth and simplify success. I'm your host, Krista Grasso, and I've been working with businesses for more than two decades to help them lean out and optimize what's working while eliminating anything that's not adding value. So if you are ready to get more time back in your day, more profit in your business, and to do business differently, growing and scaling on your terms, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. Today, I have a super special guest. I'm so excited. This is one of my new friends that I met on Necker Island, and we had the most amazing sunset chats um, out on our balconies most nights. So we'll talk a little bit about Necker Island, but who I have with me today is Nicola Wilkes, and I think I said the American pronunciation there instead of... (laughs) the proper pronunciation. She'll tell you the real pronunciation of her name. Um, (laughs) And Nicole is a success coach and she works with women in the creative and design industry, showing them how to take their business from good to great, which is what all of us want. And she really is big on creating space for them to fall back in love with their business all over again and really see their revenue soar beyond their wildest dreams and get their time back and really live a life that feels aligned with their bigger business goals. She's the founder of a new online magazine, which is pretty great. And she is host of the Empowered Business Woman podcast. So Nicola, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. And before we start, how do you really say your name? <laughs> oh my goodness, first of all, I am really excited to be here. And um, I almost don't want to tell you because I love the way you pronounce it because it makes it sound so much more interesting than the British way, which is Nicola. Um and I was telling you just before we came online to record is that my kids actually now pronounce my name and they don't call me mum, they call me Nicola. They've added a little bit on the end, Nicola, Lola, it's their thing. Um, I'm in their phones as it, so yeah, it's just, it's something that I've embraced is the American pronunciation, so please don't change it. I love it. And thank you so much for being here today. I just, I enjoyed our time together on Necker so much. It was such a great experience, but I especially loved getting to just spend some time together right before dinner on the balcony, doing a little chatting while we got to watch the absolutely gorgeous and incredible sunset. It was amazing. It was almost like we got to share daily that moment of taking a deep breath and drinking it in and almost like looking at each other across the balcony as we kind of just got out of the shower and maybe I had our hair in a towel or whatever and you know just going is this really where we are is this like this sunset here on Necker it was just a a really lovely moment daily wasn't it to just have a quick chat amongst us all and yeah it was beautiful it really was. And you said something that I think is so interesting. Michelle Glogovac and I have been talking a lot about Necker and I had her on the podcast to do a multi-part series on our takeaways. But And I want to hear some of your big takeaways. But one of the things that I thought was so interesting is there were so many of those pinch me moments like that where you're looking around and you're like, am I really here right now? Like, is that real? Is it really that beautiful? Am I really having dinner with Richard Branson right now? Is he really driving me around the island in a little buggy? Like, what is happening right now? Is this my life? And did you find that you had a lot of those moments also? Oh, all of it. And and still now, but yes, because my first meeting of Richard was actually um, hitching a lift down to Turtle Beach for our barbecue that evening in the golf buggy with him and I sat at the front in the golf buggy and just started chatting and it was just one of those moments where it's just you just can't imagine that that is going to be an experience you have and I'd held the vision for so long not quite to be sat in the golf buggy um but I'd held the vision of going to NECA for 15 years um and so yeah whilst I was there it was definitely full of and I think it was just actually one long week of pinch me moments and even before going to Necker, I don't know whether you had this as well, but I remember being on the layover in Puerto Rico and just kind of looking in the mirror in the bathroom and saying to myself, is like, you're going to Necker Island. Mm-hmm. Same. It had been on my business bucket list for so long. And so it felt really surreal. And I almost had a little bit of a 
is this really going to happen? Like, really, am I really going to show up on the island? Are they going to like, I'm going to get there and they're going to be like, just kidding. There's no spot. You know, it felt almost like, was it really going to happen? And then the whole time I'm there, it was more like, am I really here right now? I mean, it was just, I think the, the point in that is that it's, you have a preconceived idea of what it's going to be or, or not. I mean, part of the excitement is that you, you can and you can't imagine you see pictures, but you can't place yourself there because it's almost the unthinkable. But then I think that's what gives you this, this week long immersive experience of, like you say, these sunset chats we had where we're almost looking around each other and you see an iguana pass you on your balcony and, and you think, is this, is this real? Can somebody pinch me? Am I 3D right now? It was amazing. So I want to start off actually with just a couple of your favorite takeaways or moments from Necker, and then we'll dive in. And I really want to be have you share so much of your brilliance and expertise, but we've got to kick things off with a little more Necker talk. So what was some of your big, big takeaways that you brought back with you? Oh, so many. And I think the ones that really stood out for me were two very businessy focused personal growth ones and one just about nature. So the first one about nature was that how important for me it really is to connect with nature for my own spiritual well-being, for my own rootedness. Um, really that space of, like I say, you, you've got iguanas. It's nothing to be at breakfast and have an iguana, a tortoise and a lima, like all of them just there and you can you know maybe you see a flamingo fly over and it was just to really be in that habitat with nature at, so at one with it and accepting of it and, and almost it thriving and us fitting in with it it really made me think uh how important that is to me and there's a great book I love called If Women Rose Rooted and it's such a powerful read and it really is about how we connect with the our spirit sense in terms of the earth where we're from and it's it's very much based in Celtic roots I'm Celtic I'm Welsh and it just really anchored that in for me so that was hugely powerful to me I mean I came home and I swapped obviously the tortoise and the lemurs and the flamingos and that for my dog and two cats but I really joking aside got that real value of why are they so important to me and why do I need that element to be who I am but on a business sense I think I got two things was that Anyone can do this. Anyone, as long as they give themselves permission, can realize their biggest dreams. And I think one of the things with Sir Richard Branson is he has just given himself permission to go for it. He has given himself permission to fail. And he's given himself permission to make intuitive decisions and really to go against the grain on so many instances and so many decisions he's made. And that that really stood out for me hugely. And I really drank that in and have come away with that. And the other one is that there are no limits. There are literally no limits. And gosh, as women, don't we every day put so, so, so many limits on ourselves. And I really got from looking at like, like I say, Sir Richard Branson and what he's not put limits on himself as, but honestly all of the women that I was surrounded by and seeing so many incredible women, you included, and Michelle, who again was your roommate and we shared that balcony, and to see all of these women around me not putting any limits on themselves. It was incredible. And I think that's so true. And I know you talk about limits a lot and you talk about thinking bigger and how people can play small. And I remember on Necker in the beginning, so many people having this almost imposter syndrome of, do I deserve to be here? And everybody sharing it. And meanwhile, everybody else is looking at them thinking the same thing. And it was just such a surreal moment to realize, you know, everybody personally was feeling that, but everybody else was looking at them as the person that they were comparing themselves to, like, they're here, I'm not sure if I deserve to be here. And it was just so interesting. And why do you think it is that entrepreneurs do play small? Why do they keep themselves small and why do they put limits on themselves? Oh, that's such a good question. And I, I think, I think the answer is complicated in as much as it's actually quite simple as well. And I think it's, I think the answer resides in failure. And I think what we do is 
we play so small because we face failures every day, don't we? We face bumps in the road. We face, you know, things going wrong and maybe threatening to throw us off track. And I think what we don't realize, what we forget and what we just don't see early enough is that that's success. That is the road to success. And if you're almost having that feeling of, you know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck here and I don't know how to move past it. It's like, great, you're on the success path, which let me just tell you now is not going to be easy. It's not going to be this glamorous one. It's not all about the, the you know, the evening gowns and the high heels when you go for awards. It's not that. That's such a tiny fraction of what the real gritty, <laughs> I like to call it caterpillar and treacle road of success is. And I think that's a lot to do with it. And I think the other thing that's important and talking to you now, I think this is something I really enforce with my clients, especially is that we keep ourselves playing small because when we think of playing big and we get this big vision, like any of us can go create a vision board, right? But when we get so fixated on the big vision, sometimes it can be so terrifying to bring ourselves back to just where we are right now today and say, okay, so I get the big vision. So if I'm not going to be sort of, Overall, with anxiety over the big vision, if I just stopped playing small today, what's one small decision I could make today that would just take me a little bit further on the road and then a little bit further and then a little bit further? That's brilliant. I love that. And I know, you know, a lot of the work I do with my clients too is they do have these big, bold visions and it's brilliant and it's wonderful, but they have no idea how to get there. They don't know how to connect their day to day actions to that vision and it almost sometimes does put them in that analysis paralysis and they do start to play smaller because they think it's not really possible. I'm not sure what to do. There's too many different ways I might be able to get there and I don't know if any of them are going to work and so I'm just going to keep doing this little thing here that I've always done. And so I really love your perspective and what you shared there. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, ex- this is this is the point is that Okay, so we've got the big vision, but if we just start playing small today, what's one decision you'd make that wasn't a small decision? It doesn't have to be the massive one, but just today. And I do that quite a lot. If I find myself in that that space, and it could even be something personal. Um, there was something where recently I was in a situation, it was, it was a personal predicament. And I remember being stood in my kitchen saying, goodness me, Nikki, if you just stop playing small in this moment, what would the solution be? And I came up with a solution straight up because I caught myself in that moment. And I think it's just something I practice on a daily basis. And I know my clients, they get it quite quickly (laughs) because I really reinforce this. Yeah, I love that. And I want to just repeat that because I think that's such a powerful question, right? If I stop playing small in this moment, what can I do? And I think it's, it does not exactly how you said it, but I just think taking that pause to recognize that you're playing small and to think beyond it. That's really quite brilliant. I love that. And I think another way of putting it is, and I often ask clients this, is, well, there's two ways to phrase this. If I had a magic wand, if I gave you a magic wand and you could wave it right now, and this is actually a coaching trick, what would you do with it? What could you make happen? What would you change? And the other question is, okay, so if You're telling me you don't know the answer. I hear that right now, but let's just pretend that you did. What would it be? What would you do next? Mm. And that can snap people out of it too. People, us, me, you, like, let's be honest. We all get that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) None of us are immune to this. It happens all the time. And you're that's the thing is I think, you know, as you're scaling up your business, as you're moving things to the next level, your version of playing small might be a little bit bigger than it was previously, but it's still playing small for that particular level. And I think that's something that's important to think about as well is sometimes we can think back to a point in time when we were playing small and we held ourselves back and we think I've come so far, so I'm not actually playing small anymore. But are you playing full out at the level that you're currently at? at? Or are you keeping yourself playing smaller at that particular level? And I think when we all stop and really reflect on that and think about it, we can find places that we are holding ourselves back at that current level, even if we can recognize how far we've come, which I think is, you know, celebrate how far you've come, but also recognize where you can go next. 
Oh, I love that. And that is, it's so like a computer game, isn't it? And I always make this analogy that in levels of computer games, you get to a point where, you know, at each, at each level, you think I've got this. Because when you arrive at the level, you're like, I don't know where the monsters are. I don't know where they're going to come out. I don't know the tricks. I don't know how to get the bonuses. And I mean, you can tell I haven't played a computer game for a long time, but you get the gist. And at each level, it feels uncomfortable to begin with. It's always awkward before it's elegant. But what happens is when we move from awkward to it's elegant at any level, that's when we come into that area that you say is that it becomes it becomes normal again. So it's not that we're never growing, but at every level we get comfortable. We move from awkward to elegant and we have to be OK with then from that success level going up again to awkward again and then elegant. And we keep going up and up and up. And so that's why I always make the analogy of computer game. And when you do that, I think it's another good way of dealing with this is almost poking fun of yourself of being at that next level again, where you're like, oh, I'm back here. And this feels all levels of just uncomfortable and ugly. And I don't know what I'm doing again until I do. Know. It's super true. It's super true. When I work with clients to help them scale, I know sometimes they get a little... I'd say like frustrated with themselves because they're like, I'm really smart. I've run my business for so long. I've been able to grow it. Why can't I scale it? And it's like, well, because you've never scaled a business of this, this level before. Once you do it, you're going to know how to scale a business. And then the next business you do, you're going to know how to scale that, but you don't know how to do something you haven't done before. Everything you've done has elevated you to the level that you're at, which is amazing. It's not anything to do with how smart you are, how capable you are, any of those things. It's just simply, as you said, when you hit the new level, you got to find the monsters and find all the different things. It's just part of leveling up. <laughs> so and We don't know what we don't know. Nope. No matter how smart we are, we still don't know what we don't know. <laughs> another phrase that an old coach used to say as well. So she always used to say, we don't know what we don't know. And also we have to get to the point where we know that we know that we know it. And they're like two ends of this spectrum. And so it's almost like we start with that we don't know what we don't know when we end with the fact that we know that we know that we know it and it's at that point we've got to go we've got to take that leap again and get ourselves out of the comfort zone because I mean we know nothing great comes from there and I always have a client um sorry I had a client that used to say whenever they were in this situation he would stand there and he would say um okay so I get that I really don't know the answer right now but if I put myself future forward to when I'm turning over a seven figure business, what decision would I make in this moment where I've got maybe this problem client or there's a dialogue that is making him feel uncomfortable? He would think, okay, so if I just made myself kind of transport to the future of I'm running a seven figure business already, what decision would I make in this moment? And this is what you're getting at, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, completely. I love it. Now, one of the things I want to dive into also, which is kind of an extension of this conversation is, right, sometimes when you are at that place where everything does feel kind of uncomfortable, um, you either end up where you're kind of bored or you end up where you can just simply not really feel super in love with what you're doing in your business anymore. So let's start with kind of falling out of love with your business. And then I do want to talk a little bit more about what happens when people get bored. But why do you think sometimes people do feel like they fall out of love with their business? And what is it that you do to help them kind of reclaim that passion again and really want to get back into what they're doing? Oh, I think, I think this is something that we can all suffer with. And so I think it's it's so universal. And, and what's personal is universal as well. So, you know, we've all been here. And I think one of the reasons that the, the women, and I, I do coach some guys as well, um, but typically women come to me. And I think one of the things is we hit an age and a point in our career where we've either, if we're employed, we've gone through maybe some promotions or we've maybe not quite got the promotion we want, or we've moved roles or teams or companies, or like I say, if we're in a, an entrepreneurial role, a, a business of our own, where life might have also happened, maybe we've had kids or we've got divorced or let's call it out, we're going through the menopause, all of these things that come and give us different perspectives, which may create the boredom where suddenly, you know, you wake up 
typically when you're 40 and you wake up and you're like, whoa, I've just realized how much more I've got in me and I'm nowhere near done yet. And you get this like force of energy where suddenly it's like somebody has changed the glasses and the lens that you're seeing everything with. And like I say, I don't think it matters too much whether you are an entrepreneur or whether you've got a really great career behind you and suddenly you think I've got so much more to give and it's like the light bulb goes on that life is is actually there for the taking and I think that's where we can fall out of love with where we are currently and it's just about really digging deep and reigniting the passion that we have when we're younger where we think anything's possible And it's that, it's that that can cause the boredom when we're disconnected from, you know, those days where we push through no matter what, when we're younger. And I mean, do you remember as a kid when you wanted something and you'd go to your parents and say, perhaps, I want this thing. And they say, no. And you say, but I'll do anything. And you're down on your hands and knees and you're begging like, I will literally do anything. I'll sell my brother or whatever I've got to do, I'll do it. That. We lose that because what happens is life happens. But I think with a little tweaking and a reignition of confidence and belief and just reigniting those ideas, I think we can so easily fall back in love with our businesses and our careers. Yeah, I know for me, it wasn't turning 40 that did it, but it was getting the you know diagnosis of having breast cancer, which I've talked about this on the podcast before, so I know my listeners are aware, and yeah. I'm fine now, which is great. But it was a really kind of scary point in time in my life, not really knowing what the outcome would be, even to this day, right? I'm great now, but what happens if I'm not in five years or 10 years or, and so it just, it all of a sudden makes you start to look at life a little bit differently when you realize just how precious it is. And you might not have until you're 90, like you think you do. And, you know, hopefully I do, everything's great, but it just like lights up fire underneath you where you're no longer willing to settle for things that you were settling for before. And you had mentioned good to great. And for me, it was very much a where are things just good and good is no longer good enough. Like I really want things to be great. And then I don't even want things to be great. I want things to be exceptional. And it's like, what does that really look like? And I made a lot of shifts in my business where the core of what I do is still the same, but I got really selective in who I worked with. I really kind of looked at how I was delivering and fulfilling on those offers to make sure that they were things that I looked forward to and loved and that my clients that I was spending my time with, I looked forward to and loved and just, I really wanted exceptional. And so it just made me look at what I had through that different lens, as you said, and it just lit a fire underneath me in a way where I've been doing this for a really, really long time. So it gave me that perspective where I almost felt brand new again. Like, I feel almost like I only have a business that's a couple of years old, even though I literally have been doing this for 22 years, right? And so oh. it's just it's quite uh, interesting. And I think we all have those different moments. Maybe it is hitting 40 or maybe it's any other catalyst, but anytime you can pick yourself up, I think that that just, it really does help you look at it with that different perspective. So I love that so much. Oh, I think so. And and like you say, it can be a life changing event. You know, when I remember when my mum died, I decided, you know, I'm going to make sure I fulfill these goals because you see it in front of you. 110%. For me, it's actually been becoming a grandmother recently. And suddenly I'm like, whoa, there's, there's just this like fire that's been ignited in me at another level again that's just made me think right I need to have like a whole new house with a new wing to house grandchildren and you know now I want to run my business from x y or z place in the world and be able to have them around me and yeah it just it totally changes your perspective Mm -hmm. and I I think like you say it's just and this is these are some of the things we fall in love with business and let's be honest, life as well in a different way, because the two, are they're connected. We know they're connected like this. They're entwined. And I think that's where we can fall back in love with all parts of our lives, not just with the business, when we connect deep into our purpose again. 
I love that. Now, I know this is a lot of the work that you do with your clients. So if anybody's in that place where they feel a little stuck, maybe they don't feel so in love with their business or their life or the blend of the two. One is overtaking the other in a not so positive way. Um, what's What are some tips or some advice that you would give them to really start to fall back in love with it again? I think one of the things that we've got to do is be honest with ourselves and really call out straight up what we don't want to be doing. Because most of the time, the reason we've fallen out of love with our business, like I say, is something has jolted us or we've realized we're just bored. And when we're bored, like we're not going to want to get up early in the morning. We're not going to feel like pushing through. Maybe when we have a, a night of the dark soul, you know, where we need to change something up or, you know, maybe the climate economically is not so good and we need something to keep us pushing through. So I think when we're bored, for sure, that is something we need to address. And I love to get people re-engaged with vision boarding. And it's one of those things that I just feel can be underplayed sometimes. And I just think it's one of the most important things we can do when we don't have a clear vision of what we really want to achieve in life and a business. And give the the blending of the two enough weight and enough importance because we can let's face it we can get ingrained in our business and the business goals and we forget that actually we want to enjoy our lives as well so that vision has to be just as important so when we can create a vision board for our businesses that also is mimicked in a personal vision board and the two can go alongside each other or three or however many boards you want to create and you really live in that purpose of where you are going, um, that for me is, is one of the easiest and the quickest ways of making something happen. My kids are trying to help me manifest a move to a beautiful Spanish island at the moment that I desperately want to move to. And so one of the things they've called in is that we have to have Spanish food once a week and we have to do all these little things just to add layers of manifestation on. And I think this is one of the things that gets you excited and falling back in love with what you're doing. So I think that's really key. I love and I love that the whole family is in on it. <laughs> that's excellent. <laughs> and it's a vision. That's the power of the collective thought. But I think, for, like I say, falling back in love with your purpose. And if, you know what, if your purpose is gone, get rid of it. I sold a business before because I worked with a coach. And I remember for weeks and weeks, he was making me read um Simon Sinek's amazing book um start with why and I was coming in week after week saying um I just you know what I haven't got it and one day I came in and said I realize I'm just bored I'm done this business is right to sell I've got it to that place where it's totally sellable and I'm good I'm ready to move on and that's when I moved into my coaching career full-time and yeah I'm here to stay because I found the true purpose so I think being able to have the guts to call it out as well is so important. Yeah, that's true. I've let go of many businesses over the years and uh, it's not always easy to do, but it does free you up for what it is that you really want to do and why do something that's not aligned to your purpose or that thing that really fuels you and lights you up. So tell people a little bit more about you. What do you do? Tell people about your work and any exciting things you have coming up. Oh, well, I get, I think I must be the luckiest coach in the world. I get to work with designers and creatives every single day. And the reason I specialize in that is because I've been one. So, you know, I like to think I know what's going to trip you up or where you might need that extra push or accountability. People that are in the creative space typically tell themselves a false truth that they're no good at business because they see business in a very old masculine way. So they think it's the gray suit round a table, you know, boardroom table. And let's face it, that's not the business world that we are in. Hopefully, <laughs> I'd like to think we're not in anymore. Um, or there's just like the, the tail end of it. And I like to prove to them that actually if they're creative, that actually they're probably amazing at business and they've actually got the true skills that are really needed. And we can we can kind of learn and harness the other ones we might have some gaps on but really creativity I believe is like the backbone of being a great entrepreneur and a great business owner so I really work with my clients to harness that side of their creative space or their designer role and how they can 
go from good to great, how they don't have to settle in a, oh, I've got a creative job and therefore I'm no good at business and I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be in that that space where I think I can grow. I take them to a point where they think they can do anything and they can grow it as big as they want. Because I think design makes the world go around. Everything is designed. Everything we consume is designed and created. So in my head, this is so simple. And yeah, I get to work with people like that every single day. So I'm always looking for these incredible creative design-led businesses to, you know, come into this space who are ready to take the limits and push them aside. As I said, going back to NECA, just there are no limits. And that's the joy I get to work with people like that every single day. I love it. Now tell people where they can find you and learn more about your work. And for all of you creatives or people who know creatives listening, um, where you can uh, go engage. So they can head on over to our website, which is our education platform, which is seriouslystylishbusiness.co.uk. And that's where we explain, you know, what our programs are. We run group programs. We've got a mastermind. And that's where they can connect in with us there. And then, as you said at the beginning, we have just launched a brand new arm of the business, which is nicolawilkes.com, which is an online magazine and is a personal growth, inspiration, style-inspired fest of knowledge and features and articles which is in its infancy right now but we are growing and growing and growing it we want this to be that space where you can absolutely say find top five dresses with pockets that are perfect for giving a talk because who doesn't want a great pocket <laughs> you know when you stood up in the front of a room and you don't know what to do with your hands or you know, what are the best lipsticks to wear when you're talking all day and you want your lipstick to stay on? Or how do you make sure your makeup stays on from morning till night when you're working and you've got back to back meetings, as well as all of these deeper subjects? And this was a dream for so long for me. So that's something that we're super excited that we get to bring to our audience this year. And get them connecting on another level. And to be honest, this is just my wish list of all the things I want to know. So I'm going to write it from the heart. I love it. Yeah, it's brilliant. And it's pretty amazing so far. I can't wait to see where you evolve it, but it's excellent. And everyone, you'll find all the links down below in the show notes so you can get connected. All right. One final question I have to know your answer to, and that is how do you work smarter, not harder and keep things lean in your business? Oh, I love that you've asked me this. And my question, my answer, sorry, to your question is really simple in that I have adopted a good is good enough approach for me because I am a total Virgo perfectionist, or I have been. And I realized that my path to scaling and success was being hindered by perfection paralysis. So I have totally wrapped my arms around the good is good enough because here's the thing, most of us, our good is way more than good enough. Our good is the other person's, you know, our great is different. Our good is more than good enough. It's probably perfect and we're just procrastinating over the detail and that's something that's really helped me scale and just move on and get that energy and keep things going faster and faster. Ah, brilliant. I love it. And it is true. Our good probably is frequently better than what people would ever expect or need. So exactly. and we know it. We know that. Mm hmm. Thank you so much for being on the show. I can't wait for someday. Maybe we'll be back on Necker watching the sunset from the balconies again. Oh, wouldn't that, that would be love love that. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. Everybody, I hope you loved today's interview and episode as much as I did. We'll see you again next week. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. I hope you got a lot of value and actionable insights from today's show and would love if you take a moment to leave us a review. 
you have any questions on today's episode or on how to lean out your business, join us over in our private Facebook community where every week we do live training and Q&A and I'd love to have you be part of the conversation. Head to leanoutmethod.com slash group to join us. And before you go, be sure to subscribe to the show so you're the first to know when we release a new episode. We'll see you next week.